how can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. main creative endeavors of my life, woodworking and furniture making, and now that's morphed into sculpture that's made of wood and collaborating with Graham, which is awesome. But then the other things that I get really drawn to are music and making food and arranging things bringing in little parts of the natural world inside and making beautiful spaces. So I think like nesting is another creative endeavor of mine. <laughs> well, we have built a tiny house and then we're going to build more on this land that we just got. Um, I feel like even working this land is kind of a creative endeavor because we're clearing, we're moving, we're thinking about space and how things are going to be laid out. And so even that pot of land is kind of a big canvas for us. There's really, I can't think of many things creatively that don't kind of call to me in some way, but then it's just trying to pare them down so that you have some hope of actually getting good at one or two of them. And that's the really hard bit for me. What about you, Graham? Um, I've kind of been a jack of all trades most of my life. Not sure if I've mastered any of them, but definitely um, tried hard on woodworking. So woodworking is my main thing, but I had a 12 year career as a radio technician as well which had its own creative side. It's very technical creative, but it kind of taught me a lot. But then with modern technology, that all went out the door. So I gave that up because I need to work with my hands. So I built houses, I've gardened all my life, building raised beds and laying out beautiful gardens and orchards is a big passion of mine and cooking. We try to outdo each other with our cooking. <laughs> um, sometimes we cook together. That's true. Um, but yeah, for the last 30 years, wood has been fairly all-consuming, mainly wood turning, carving, texturing, a fair bit of production work just to pay the bills. So I go anything from a salad bowl to a giant wall sculpture, whatever the customer wants at the time. But I've always found it important to have a balance of production items and more creative items. You grew up in New Zealand, and is it true there is a heritage and a way of kind of thinking about things where, like you're saying, you fix things that are broken, you find creative solutions for dealing with broken things in your house or how to build things with what you have. What was that like for you growing up, that way of thinking about things? I kind of feel a bit blessed to have grown up in that do-it-yourself culture which kind of came from we just didn't have a walmart down the road or a lowe's you know <laughs> it was um and pretty well from our settler days which aren't as old as american settler days we're a much younger european settlement in new zealand so we're kind of not as far removed from or not as long time removed from actually just having to live off the land and build everything yourself and do everything like yourself. being a pioneer, basically. Yeah, right? so, so we're a lot closer to our pioneer ancestors than people are probably here. And I guess it depends who you, where you grew up and how you grew up. I grew up with a father who was literally a jack of all trades. I never saw a tradesperson come into our house when I was living at home. My dad did everything. He did the wiring. He did the plumbing. He re-blacktopped the driveway he the car never went to the garage he did all the work on that you know he just did everything because and I, I guess initially because he just didn't have the money to pay people to do things so he learned how to do it himself Melissa when you were younger so you were born in Canada 
I was actually born in Miami. It's a weird little side story. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> my mom, <laughs> I was conceived in Canada and then my mom came down to be with her family in Miami, her mom and dad to like actually have me and then went right back up. So I was like six weeks old or something when we went back up. So I definitely feel like that is where my growing up happened, but I wasn't technically born there. Then you ended up in Hendersonville, mm -hmm. North Carolina, more as a teenager. And then we met, we were serving tables together at the good old Laughing Seed Cafe, downtown mm -hmm. Asheville, vegetarian so restaurant, go check it out. You know, now you have been to Haywood Community College for wood. You have met Graham, the amazing Graham. Mm -hmm. And then you guys hit the road teaching and people actually know who you are. They know your work. Within, I guess it was a year or two ago, I was going through the folk art center, the gallery upstairs, there was a show and I was like, wow, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I was like, woo, I like that one. And it was totally you guys. I love that story. That I really was like, oh my gosh, it was, it was such a great piece. Um, so we'll get more into some of that in a minute. But what I'm curious about is your childhood and from when, when we met compared to where you are now, what happened for you in your creative path between childhood and then deciding to make woodworking more your thing yeah it was really meandering but the thing that I can say for sure growing up with my parents they were both artists themselves and very creative people my dad was a photographer and a mountaineer and my mom was a painter she learned from her grandmother and my great-grandmother so that was always a big part of our family understanding. It was never considered some goofy thing that you're gonna go do and it's not practical. It was just like, yeah, of course. Um, so I feel really lucky that I didn't ever have that hang up about like, you're not supposed to be doing this. Out of high school, I didn't really do much with anything. I just was part of kind of the restaurant scene, you know, just having fun. I guess some people would call it a creative life of sorts. I was wandering around, being very much in the moment, uh, being in nature, experimenting with all kinds of crazy things that maybe we won't go into right now. <laughs> and it, to me, now looking back, it feels a little bit like wasted time or like I spent a little bit too much time in that phase because I see other people my age and they've accomplished a lot more as far as being on a path career-wise, creatively. And I lost like a whole decade just not really thinking about it. But it's okay. I like, I like to think that it's informing what I do somehow. I remember a moment where you were like, I'm going to go study art at UNCA. Yeah. There's another moment where you're like, Ooh, I'm going to go to Haywood. Yeah. What, what got that going? I think it was in part that I was just a little bit tired of doing that same old, same old thing. So I've kind of been doing that stuff since I was probably 17 and maybe just maturity just got to the point where I realized that this isn't really like how I see spending the rest of my days on this earth. It's just being in the moment and drinking a beer in the sunshine, you know, even though I still love that. But at some point I wanted to do a little bit more. I don't want to say, I don't know, maybe there's a little bit of ambition that starts to creep in there a little bit. Like, I want something I do to be meaningful or seen or like effective in some way. Uh, also, I just, my mind was wanting to have challenges, I guess. I missed being in school. I missed like reading books and talking with other people about them and kind of having philosophical conversations. And so that's what really drew me back to it. But even then, when I went back to UNCA, I wasn't totally sure I was going to do art. I was just going back to school. And then the art part was kind of in competition with wanting to learn language. Oh, yeah, that's another one. That's another thing that I always really wanted to do. And I know you've done that, which is amazing, like learning French. So I was in a lot of Spanish classes and I wanted to do that at one point. I was thinking, I'm just going to become a fluent Spanish speaker. I'm going to travel Spanish speaking places and do this. And there was a moment where I was taking both of those classes simultaneously, trying them both out. And I was in a sculpture class. So it was really the three dimensional work that pulled me harder than anything else. The two dimensional stuff I love, but the three dimensional, when I was in those classes, 
And I mean, it's kind of like the cliche, right? Where you lose track of time and you're just so into this thing that you're doing and so into the moment that everything else disappears. And that was really the first time that I'd had that feeling. And that's what made me kind of drop the other things by the wayside and just try to pursue that, which is what led to Haywood because that's furniture making, three-dimensional, bringing in these craft processes because I'm really enamored with things that are made well and this world of craft that's more about not just creating like a conceptual cool thing, but about how it's crafted and how long it's going to last and all the different things that go into that. So Graham, why do you think the woodworking kind of pulled to the front? There are so many things you could choose as a career. The, the defining moment was towards the end of my technician career when technology was just um, leaving me behind. Computers, you know, I grew up on those little glass tube things and computers, I couldn't see how they worked and I couldn't attack them with my soldering iron. So it became all very cerebral. You became a systems analyst, not actual technician building and fixing things. So it kind of lost the plot for me when I couldn't work with my hands and my brain can't handle that much. So. And also my kids were really young then. I had three kids, first one just started school. And when I had my first boy, my first baby boy, I'd, I'd done a little bit of woodworking at middle school, the wood shop, but then my parents forced me into high school into a more academic Latin, French, maths, all that stuff. I, I, I didn't like that. But my parents wanted me to be an accountant. Never gonna happen. So I went down this technician job, like I left school at 16 and straight into that job. And then when my first son was born, my mum had given me a book on wooden projects. And one of them was building a set of wooden bunks, which we didn't have a bed for the new baby or when he got bigger. So I thought, oh, I'll build some wooden bunks for, for him. And it was a really nice design. And I went to town, bought some beautiful timber and a little, little cheap table saw and just the few basic tools I needed to knock out this set of wooden bunks. And what fascinated me was sanding the wood, particularly the end grain and watching that end grain go from this fuzzy nothing to this gorgeous picture kind of thing. And that is what hooked me. And then I guess I was... I was at a like a garden show somewhere and I saw this freeform furniture, like creative furniture built out of limbs and driftwood and stuff like that. And that really kind of caught my interest. And that's what I thought I was going to do. And then when my job basically became redundant as a technician, just headed off on a whole new career path. And I thought, what's going to be it? I'm going to buy a hundred acres of rainforest and build f furniture out of the dead fall wood on the land. So I bought the hundred acres of rainforest in the far north of New Zealand and met a furniture maker doing just what I wanted to do. And he said, forget it. And it was the late eighties, big stock market crash, no market. He was working at a farm next door, building horticultural um, plastic houses because he couldn't sell furniture at that time because of the economy. He says, but if you want to do wood, you should think about wood turning. And I says, nah, wood turning, no. Salad bowls and chair legs, no. I don't think I could stand in a workshop eight hours a day knocking out that kind of stuff. He says, oh, no, 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 you need to come and meet my friends. And he took me to meet a, a small group of wood turners in a town about half an hour from where I was living, and they were what they called studio wood turners. They didn't do salad bowls and chair legs. They did sculptural objects. And that I had no idea that wood turning could be that creative and that much fun. And then the first, I think that first night I went there, they were playing a video of this guy, David Ellsworth, who's probably the most known wood turner in America, who had recently toured New Zealand. Uh, and they're watching a video of one of his demonstrations and, and saying, yeah, it's this guy from America, David. He actually lives in Weaverville now. Um, he does, yeah, just down the road. It's funny. It's very funny how things come around. And so I thought, oh, okay, I think I'll be the next David Ellsworth. And he looks like he has fun. He makes these wooden things. He sells them for thousands of dollars in this fancy gallery in LA. And he travels all around the world teaching this stuff. I, hmm, sounds interesting. But I guess the main thing I wanted was a quiet life at home with my children. As a technician, I was on the road all the time and on call and not enjoying watching my young babies grow up. 
as much as I wanted. So buying the land, getting into something I could work from home was so mainly selfishly so I could have more time with my kids, escape the, the high, high pressure um, technical job and things like that and run away and hide and make things. People like David Ellsworth and these people and they got me into this crazy travel and all over the world teaching and stuff. And so my quiet life at home went out the door. 30 years on, we're starting to come back to that. We just bought some land and uh, aiming back towards the quiet life and gardens. And yeah. Yeah. That is the thing about kids and gardens is, is kind of staying home as part of it. And so true. Yeah. You had that, that phase in your life with small children and making at the same time. And how did that work for you? This idea of making in the middle of things and juggling both. It wasn't probably as hard for me as some, because I'd come from a 12 year career where I'd already bought and sold two houses. I got a redundancy payout. We bought our land freehold. You know, I didn't have to pay rent or a mortgage. Uh, it was 100 acres. I could cut wood off there. I didn't have to buy materials for my woodworking. It was all, all around me. Big gardens and orchards lived off the land. Uh, the kids were little preschool and, and primary school, so they're cheap to run. It's only when they get to <laughs> high school, they cost an arm and a leg. Um, so we managed pretty well just off my woodworking income. I also bought a like a chainsaw mill. I was milling wood and selling wood to other woodworkers. I started importing wood from Australia to sell to other people and for my own use. I did so many different jobs in that period. I dug ditches. I worked for plumbers. I picked up hay for the local farmers. I fixed fences for some neighbors. I roasted chestnuts in the mall in winter and sold them. I made juggling balls and sold them through a toy distributor. I honestly have lost count of how many different jobs I did while I was building my woodworking career. And my wife wasn't working. So she was the stay home mum and helping with gardening and cooking all that. So I didn't. So we were in a fortunate situation until they became teenagers. Then it started getting expensive. And then we had to start thinking a bit more seriously about um, <laughs> a bit more than a wood turning income. So, um, so yeah, but it was always a struggle financially. I can't say those years of establishing while uh, we had kids at school, we didn't go ahead that much financially, but we established gardens and orchards and built things and lived off the land a, a lot and, uh, and made sure we enjoyed a good lifestyle with our kids, took them to the beach a lot and stuff like that. So it wasn't all work and no play. Yeah, you were choosing a different quality of life. Yes. Yes, yeah. on purpose. Yes. Mm -hmm. on purpose. It was a conscious decision. And there was just, there's always so many reasons to why we do something and choose something that isn't just necessarily financial. For me, there was health considerations at that time too. I'd just come off working, you know, seven, eight years at a radio station on a remote farm that every year was drenched in Agent Orange to control weeds. So I had eight years exposure to Agent Orange and have friends that died from that and got pretty nasty illnesses and that. And so for me, going away from that job and those kind of places into 100 acres of rainforest, drinking pristine, beautiful, clean water out of the creek, uh, well away from any pollution or overspray from, you know, New Zealand's half farms, there's always overspray. I'm a big anti-chemical advocate. <laughs> <laughs> Permaculture, organic farming. So I felt I needed that 20 years at that beautiful, pristine place to uh, hopefully cleanse my system. And to date, no ill adverse effects from Agent Orange. So now you both live in a tiny house that you built yourself and you work in business together in the same studio. I know that you never argue ever. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize this was a comedy session. <laughs> and I, I love, you know, you're very, you're both so open about the dynamics of things and how do you juggle having alone time or making decisions together? I mean, being in business together and living in small quarters is 
pretty big, you know, right. and I know, of course, you really also really like each other. Um, you're also both learning some old time banjo. Uh, you've been taking some lessons with me and it's been super fun. And it started out with Melissa and then Graham, you're like, Ooh, what is this? And you're like, you're totally in love with it. So now you're also sharing a banjo. So what, what can you say to folks out there? You got any tips and tricks for surviving that togetherness? <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> For me, sense of humour, a shared sense of humour, verging on the dark, <laughs> is <laughs> so important <laughs> that you can laugh at the adversities. Agreed. We can now laugh at the fight we had yesterday and not hold grudges on and on well at least not more for more than two days or so <laughs> i'm holding on to mine i don't know about you <laughs> <laughs> um, and i think i mean not to sound um like defeatist or anything but maybe you get to a certain point in life too where you're just like okay it's not totally perfect but this is what i've got and it's enough to work with mm. you know like you get a little bit out of that big romantic feeling that you might have had when you were younger or even in the beginning of this relationship about it's the most perfect thing and we are so united and we're soulmates and all that stuff and you kind of realize okay maybe yes we are that but we also are very different people and we also have these issues and every moment is not going to be perfect but there's enough here to work with and i do not want to start over because if you started over it's all just going to happen again do you know what i mean like it's you get a little bit realistic about what relationships are I guess for me anyway. Definitely. And I think it's easy to on the outside romanticize like, wow, they're making sculptures together. Exactly. And so, but there's always a flip side. So there's the tension you might have about a certain aesthetic decision, mm -hmm. and, but at the same time, you are successfully creating work together. So it's not just that you have a studio you share and you're both making, I know you both work, do your own work too, but you have so many things together. So even though it can be romanticized, there is a part of it that is romantic and really cool too. It doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah. No, not easy. But it, is, it is wonderful. I mean, I, I've been doing this collaboration stuff for decades now through these collaboration conferences and things I've been going to for a long time all over the world. And now to actually be able to carry, not just go into a collaborative conference for a week and then go away back to your own isolated thing. But to be able to be in a collaborative situation every day is really wonderful, but also hard. And when you're collaborating, it's very easy to see one person makes something and gives it to another person and they do something on it. And so you see this person on that person or vice versa, but to actually come up with a new body of work that isn't obviously weighted to any one person or obviously of any one person's style and create a whole new thing, which we've kind of managed to do, is kind of exciting and okay. and it is like sometimes the other thing that i've been trying to incorporate into my personal practice if you want to call it that is just backing up and looking at that big picture thing like you were just talking about like it's easy to get like fussy and annoyed with this person that you spend so much time with but i just try to spend a little bit of time each morning and think about like how amazing it is that one, I'm with somebody who is so on the same page as far as like what we're interested in doing, how we're interested in doing it, not just with art, both like land building and home building and all the stuff we've talked about, now even music. I'm also really lucky to have like a very um, knowledgeable person about all these different things. Like Graham's been around a little bit longer than me and he's done a ton of stuff. Sometimes that's annoying because he does know a lot of things, almost everything, not everything, not everything. And so I've been trying to just really back up and think about those things each day and think about how lucky I am and lucky that I'm not having to work a nine to five job. And yeah. like, that's probably come out of this relationship and the things that Graham was already building. And now I'm kind of part of that. And wow, it's incredible to just like not to be really most of the time living how I want to be living. I mean, what a gift. Mm -hmm. And also a thing we have in common is international relationships. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if I'm having a hard time with my sweetheart, I have to stop and remember we're lucky to even be in the same country in the same room. Exactly. The first time we were together for that first year, we were seven months apart back and forth because yeah. we couldn't legally be in the same country because that is very challenging process. And mm -hmm. it's not the same that you have to deal with when you marry a fellow 
person from your own country. Exactly. Mm. And like we all fought for that and we all gave up a lot to have that. Mm. And so I think that's part of, in a way, what makes us, and maybe you guys too, feel like, listen, we're going to make this work. You know, like we, we have given up too much and we have fought too hard. Like it's working. And spent too much on pieces. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's part of the tension too, probably, I assume for you and Jero too, is that they are from a different culture and they have also given up so much to be here. And so sometimes it feels selfish for me to even have like a single thing that I want you to be or do because you gave up your whole freaking life to be here with me. So I could be in my comfort zone with my family and my things. But then at the same time, you can't just like not have an opinion or a feeling about anything. You have to kind of like, I'm still a person. I still have things that yeah. I need and want, even though you have given up so much how do you navigate that and that's i think a lot of our little things our little spats that we get into are about that for me that separation from country family lifelong friends does take a toll at times i i try to be strong and just box on and yep shut that out but sometimes it just sneaks up and smacks me in the back of the head and i just go down for a few days and total <laughs> Try not to cry homesickness and stuff like that. You know, I got kids, I got grandkids all on the other side of the world, parents, sisters. Uh, uh. Yeah. It's really tough. And then sometimes I think, why don't you understand? I'm totally out of my comfort zone here. Yes. Everything you're saying totally relate to in our family too. Yes. Yeah. Everything. The homesickness, it's like, it almost feels like something's wrong. You don't know what it is because it's very invisible and very deep. Yeah. yeah. And then you're like, oh, that's what it is. Right. And then it flows through. You know, I've spent uh, our son number one was born there and we had that whole year there and then other months that happened before that. And I think on one hand, I can relate to, you know, first wedding was there. So my friends weren't there for there. And so we had that exchange. But at the same time, so I can understand how he feels because I was there, but I didn't stay for 10 years, you know, and so always very aware of what that's feeling like for him. And it's very heartbreaking. So it's sort of like, but it's also a rich life. It's like you always have the heartbreak, no matter which country you're in, the other is dealing with that. And that's a part of the relationship dynamic and, yeah. and it'll always be there. And also, but it's the rich life in terms of the benefit of both cultures, the benefit of both places of food and of family in these places and all of that. So I'm curious, basically, this is like a, it's like a cultural collaboration that you're dealing with and then a living collaboration. You're talking about collaboration and creativity. What do you think about for people in general with creativity and collaboration? Because I tend to want to lean towards being by myself in my studio and then I'll miss working with someone. It's not always easy to just go find that or know what form that's supposed to come. Mm -hmm. What do you think when you're talking to students about collaboration and creativity? I guess I, I feel like one, it's kind of individual because a lot of collaboration has less to do with what you're actually making and more like your personality mm -hmm. and how well that you can mesh with somebody and mm -hmm. not feel like, you're taking over or letting them take over. Like it's kind of a magical little thing that sometimes we hit and sometimes we don't hit, you know? So it's a combination of personality types matching up well, and then your work being same enough that it makes sense, but also different enough that there's interest and tension. And that's something I think that at least with Graham and I, it's funny in a way, because like we're so on the same page that it's like, sometimes I feel like it's lacking a little bit of that tension of like, oh, the other person's work and this is how it's influencing it. And also because we are in the same space all the time, pretty much everything I'm making, he's commenting on and vice versa. So it's, we are always collaborating. So then when we sit down to make a thing together, it's kind of a little bit of that tension of like a whole new person that I don't even hardly know trying to merge with their style or their mindset, sometimes that can be wonderful because it just brings in totally different energy. And then oftentimes it can be horrible because it's just like, it's not an easy thing and it's not gonna work with everybody, I don't think. And for me, I've been to over 30 collaborative conferences over the last 
since the mid 90s. I've been going to these collaborative conferences in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, France, Hawaii, they're all over the world and they're amazing events. But it's hard. It's hard being thrown in with 50 to 100 other people when trying to work with people you don't necessarily know or you don't share a culture or a interest with. I think Melissa and I collaborate well because we are so into the natural world. She's more mountains and alpine stuff. I'm more coastal, oceanic from New Zealand. But, but the, there's still that commonality of our absolute passion for the natural world and the care of it and the expression of it that hopefully lead other people to care for it. So we mesh pretty well because nature repeats no matter what the environment. So we've got that commonality there. That does help. Sure. You know, her ammonite fossils from the Canadian Rockies match my Nautilus in New Zealand. <laughs> so we've got that commonality, which makes it easy. But I've collaborated with so many people, which it's a struggle, or it's just me doing a little decorative thing on something they made, or them doing a little decorative thing on something I made. Like, that's making me think, too, about how if somebody is wanting to collaborate, what do they want from that? Do you want like an amazing piece of art that came from your collaboration or do you just want the experience of meshing with somebody and trading ideas? Because sometimes that can be really good, but like the thing you make kind of sucks. I mean, like a lot of times. Because it's the first piece, it's going to suck. It's <laughs> not great, you know, but uh, you had this great experience creating it. So I think maybe people that are wanting to do yeah. it, think about what you're trying to get out of it. And I think it's just the same as any other skill learning music, learning a language, learning woodworking, learning painting, learning anything, it takes decades of practice to hone and perfect. And I totally agree with Melissa. Some of my favorite collaborations never got made. <laughs> the one that stands out of my mind the most is a guy, Clay Foster, a wood sculptor who's up in Indianapolis now, wonderful guy, Clay. And he came to a collaborative conference in New Zealand and we thought we'd make a translation machine you know, one half of the machine, like a double typewriter, one half, you push a button and an American saying comes up and then push a button on the other <laughs> side and the Kiwi equivalent comes up, <laughs> you know, so, so we spent basically a week discussing what all the different sayings would be and how we design the machine, but we never made it, but we had a blast designing it <laughs> and we still never made it 20 years later. Well, but I love that because it's like the experience is so exciting and it can be very rejuvenating. It feeds your general creativity. You still have this positive feeling that goes through you when you tell that story. And then also without knowing how or where or when it's informing work you make from that point on. Yeah. Exactly. And it does, it creeps in. It's really interesting. And it does like tweak something that you wouldn't have thought of if you hadn't run into that person and done that thing yeah. with them. So and then there's just such a deeper level of sharing, again, cultures and uh, environments and life experiences, which uh, sort of really informs future work and stuff like that and future opportunities to travel and, and see different places and visit with different people and, and, and welcome it all in and um, jumble it all up and some of it will pop out later and some of it might not. It doesn't really matter. And I know that feeling you were talking about in France, like yeah. I certainly have felt that. I just had like total breakdown sometimes. I was there for six months and like, you just don't even really know who you are kind of without your people and your things. And yeah, it's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> it's another thing that just takes time. You know, all of this is the accumulation of the small things, you know, the artwork, learning new things, learning how to be in another culture, all of it. It takes yeah. just time and time and a little more time. Yeah. So I'm curious, what are some things you're doing that fill up your inspiration cup? Uh, books you're reading or other people's work you're enjoying or podcasts you're listening to that, you know, are a recipe for of the moment that's just mm -hmm. feeding you right now? It's funny when we do teaching or conferences and people ask you where you get your inspiration from. And definitely, I mean, nature, obviously, like it's something that Graham and I really share and is a core of our relationship. And it's a really sweet thing is the attention that we pay. Like when we're walking around outside, we're both noticing like this little pod and the weird little texture that it has on it or how sweet it is the way that that little moss tucks into the corner of the rock there and stuff like that. So that's always there. And I try to make time 
each day, even if just walking outside the studio and I just sit there and watch and listen and like little birds and all those sweet little things. And that definitely always makes me feel renewed going back into the studio. But also it's funny, the things that I'm inspired by book wise mm -hmm. don't really have anything to do with like craft or aesthetics or anything. They're way more about ecology and relationships and stuff like this. So like I just finished Omnivore's Dilemma. What was the one I read before that? Sapiens. And so like, it's interesting that those really do kind of make me think about what I want to make and and why and sort of having a message to the work like that coral piece that you liked was about coral bleaching and so those kind of books actually help me understand more the why I guess and then the just being outside and looking at things and appreciating is sort of the what. Oh that, that's really a hard one but for me being out in nature is the biggest thing. Reading books I tend to read books to escape my reality. So I tend to read more novels. I have been read. I read half a sapiens and gave it. I read <laughs> Omnivore's Devel Omnivore's Dilemma. There was just too much um, reality reading. And I did a big burst of it. Now I just can't do it anymore. I've got to go back to mindless novels, other worlds. So I'm reading some sci fi at the moment, which is not my thing. Um, but even just reading that, there's these little mites that in the sci fi world that get into your skin and they're describing these little microscopic mites that, that get made and go into your skin. And, and the, the one I'm just reading about uh, just reminds me of a, a sea urchin, a little spiky ball thing that just like attaches to you. And so even when I'm reading something totally out of this world, it takes little things come up that remind me of the things that I am familiar with and that can inform my work in the future and stuff like that. I do a lot of work based on sea urchins. So these little mites kind of captured my attention. Hmm. And the thing is that it's almost like either that's a brain break where you had a rest from what you think about all the time. Yeah. And then the other benefit of doing things you don't usually do or who that aren't really you or going a place you wouldn't go or driving home a different way is there's inspiration out there that's not our business to know. And we accidentally come upon it if we were willing to just try that new different thing. Definitely. And that's fun. You don't know where inspiration is going to come from. It mm -hmm. could come from anywhere. Exactly. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes in life, and it's going back to this guy, Clay Foster. He's one of my heroes in the wood turning world. He's a wonderful guy. And he was doing a demo one time. And one of the uh, people in the demo says, Clay, how do you, how the heck do you keep pulling these ideas out of your pockets? And Clay just looked at him. Well, I spent a lifetime filling my pockets. Fill the pockets all the time. You don't know no. what you're going to use it for. <laughs> Keep your eyes open. <laughs> don't look at your feet. Look at everything around you. <laughs> if people are curious or interested to see your work or learn more about you, how might they do that? They could go on our horribly not updated websites. Oh, two years <laughs> out of date now. <laughs> That'd probably be the best spot, huh? Yeah. MelissaEngler.com and GrahamPriddle.com or they could come by our studio right next to the Grove Park Inn in Grovewood Village. Grovewood.com. We're starting to do some teaching from, from our little workshop again, which is good. They can come to our location now, but it's only one-on-one -on -one at the moment, one person at a time. We did produce a couple of videos for a recent virtual symposium. So we have two one and a quarter hour videos that are available for remote viewing. We're not very good at the live Zoom thing. It's a lot to organize and our space is fairly small. So to set up good lights and camera for live Zooming is just not really possible in our little space. Well, you guys are too busy collaborating, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and arguing. And, arguing. <laughs> and then making up and eating some good food. Do you have any last thoughts in honor of supporting folks who want to be creative in their lives and not giving up? But just just make stuff and it doesn't matter what you make and how you make it um and don't just make one and give up because it's not very good make at least three because by the third one it'll start getting good a lot of times people feel a little bit trapped by the things that they've chosen to be trapped by like say a mortgage or um, an idea of how comfortable you want to be in your life monetarily and a lot of us that have chosen this path have 
kind of made sacrifices in that regard. Like you live in a one room house with your entire family. We live in a tiny house. Like none of us are dealing with the mortgages and the things that kind of make you beholden to those quote unquote real jobs. Um, so since time actually is limited at some point, something's got to give. And that if somebody's really wanting to choose this path and they might think about what, what are you willing to give up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be worth it. I think, yeah. I mean, everyone I've ever known who's jumped off that little cliff has been really glad they did. So it's a different kind of rich life. It, it is, is absolutely. And if you want to get good at it, an hour a day, that's all you have to do. You've yeah. just got to give up something else for an hour a day and put that into another direction you want to go go in. And I think that's a that's probably the best advice I ever got. Hour a day. Yeah. Well, you guys are awesome. I'm glad that you're my friends. I appreciate you Likewise. being open to this conversation. Absolutely. And one thing I would just like to add to Annie Fain is the one thing that keeps us going is people like you and our wonderful creative network. And that's how you fast track is by getting involved with other creative people. You were one of my first inspirations that you could actually live this kind of life because you were just doing it. And so was your whole family. And uh, it just made open my eyes to the reality that it's very possible. You just have to choose it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for saying that. Yes. We all, everybody needs their buddies. You need your buddies yeah. to, that understand what you're trying to do. And yeah. it doesn't have to be a profession. It just, it's like your creative lifestyle choices and all of that. Exactly. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. <laughs> Bye everyone. If you would like to be in touch or have someone you would love to hear interviewed, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. I also hope that you're inspired to subscribe to this podcast. New episodes come out every Tuesday. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fane House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards for my watercolor originals, I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you'll get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You'll also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If that all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly backslash Fainhouse to sign up. That's with a capital F and a capital H in Fainhouse. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. I'm Annie Fain Barillon. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll leave you with a quote for the day. I'm certain of nothing but the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of imagination. John Keats. <laughs>